I begin by invoking the name of the Creator of the Universe, our Lord and Protector, Almighty God, Allah. I wish you all peace and good fortune, all of those listening to this uh, presentation. So the question I was asked was uh, to explain the concept of madhab and um, if you're a Muslim you definitely have heard of the term madhab um, if you're not a Muslim then I would suggest you don't even maybe bother that much to find out about it um, or a quick visit to Wikipedia will update you but uh, for Muslims this is a very very important concept and it's a concept that I wish to clarify and to present to you my own understanding and um, research. Personally, I have done a bit of reading or studying about Madhab. Many years ago, I published a translation of a book, Mudakiratul Firak, which is a, uh, a book written in, by an Egyptian scholar about the, um, the various Madhabs that exist. Also, I've done a translation of a basic book by uh, one of the central leader figures or scholars in Islamic uh, scholarship, um, Mutawalli, by Mutawalli. Um, and uh, so I have, I have, I've done some work around translating and uh, explaining the place and the role of mother. <coughs> so let me present to you my understanding and how I um, would like to you know view the idea of madhab. I'm going to do a presentation is about 10 slides we'll see how long it takes. Um, so first of all let's look at the concept of madhab. Um, what in Arabic it's, it's a mim with a three root letters dal ha and pa Wait, let me just get back okay, need of me right so let's start here madhab means to go and the word madhab uh, sorry dahaba means to go and um, the word madhab means a pathway get it right so and so madhab is also a metaphor for school of thought so you get madhahib which is the plural of madhab madhabs of akida which are core doctrines basic beliefs in other words and then you get mazahib of fiqh which is jurisprudence or canon of law so you get pathways for akida and you get pathways of law so just to look at some pathways or schools of akida core doctrines you get the ashari doctrinal school, Maturidi doctrinal school, Mutazilite doctrinal school. Now I just I'm, I'm, I realize that I'm just giving a bunch of names here which is pretty much uh, Greek <laughs> or Arabic to you and so rather than bombard you with a bunch of Arabic terms yeah let me let me shed some light here but just to to, to leave this thought with you that there are many 
schools of court doc doctrine in the Islamic tradition. First, let me take uh, the Mutazilite doctrinal school. Let me look at that one as an example because I've put the, it's the it's a rationalist school. And um, what is meant by this one, or what this one entails, it's an essentially an, a very early Islamic doctrine. So it's a doctrinal school that emerged um, that emerged um, sort of immediately after the end uh, of the um, the initial prophet and the initial um, rightly guided what 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 term the rightly guided leaders the four first uh, caliphs and um, the mutazila essentially is a is a a group or an or an or an approach to islam that is essentially rationalist and uh, it uh, uses rationalist means logical means it uses a lot of uh, sort of uh, Aristotelian logic to um, arrive at um, positions at, at new knowledge and um, so new knowledge or new laws is arrived at by looking at the core source which is the text of the Holy Quran and then with that we apply rational argumentation and logical deduction and most of the time deductive logic uh, from the Quran. So uh, that is the rationalist school of thought. But there's there's also others. There's, for example, let's let's look at an interesting one here, the Jabberites, um, a school of thought that um, is essentially um, focused on divine um, predestination. And uh, it and it um, the Jabberite school looks at the Jabberite school um, <coughs> sees essentially that the world um, and human beings are all subject to divine will at every second or at every moment um, of his existence. So no human being has any independent power of agency, power of decision making, um, and that all decision making is essentially in the hands of God. And we are complete and perfect um, instruments of God. So that is the Jabberite school of thought, which contrasts completely with the rationalist school of thought that uh, sees human beings as essentially rationalist and vested with agency, and that human beings have the power um, and the ability to decide independently, and uh, that God only shares perhaps um, the broader frame in which people are, oh, sorry, God's power uh, does not include deciding for human beings uh, their voluntary actions. So I don't understand still here too long, but that is uh, some of the ideas that will differ. And then the main issues that um, these schools cover are actually um, God's power versus man's free will and for example is God limited to acting righteously or justly so that would be a, also a key point that is discussed within uh, the madhab within core doctrinal pathways and then another important question that also arises within this is 
who is a Muslim and who is not a Muslim. So, for example, the um, the the, the Mutazila will invent a station, um, you know, that will, will will declare the person who is not in compliance with Islamic laws as a, a as a Farsic or as a, as a as a, um, a person in breach and um, will not co call that person Muslim. So Muslim is, is actually a term that refers to a, to a state of being where the person is in compliance with the law. So once you go out of compliance with the law, then you are considered to be in breach and you are no longer considered a Muslim, but rather a, a breach um, or a transgressor. Um, <clears throat> but not as uh, then the, there is another school of thought, school of thought in basic uh, fiqh uh, called the Khawarij or the Kharijite, who sees the person who is in breach of law not as a transgressor or in breach, but rather as a as a rejecter of the law. So they equate breaching the law with rejecting the law or, or, or negating the law. And so there's a, there's a difference because apply to their position of declaring you a negator of the law or a kafir, they then apply the, 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 the penalty that is due for somebody being a negator of the law, which is in their understanding, death, so execution. So um, a lot of what we've seen in the world in present times is that um, Khawarij ideas where people who are found to be in breach of the law are then um, assumed to be negators or opponents of the law and there's a conflation of those two concepts and therefore you find the Khawarij or the modern day Khawarij which I regard as the Salafi, Sal Salafists, ISIS types, you know, um, that they then move to the point of considering those people worthy of the death penalty. Just quickly move on. So I just want to discuss rationalist versus non-rationalist schools of thought in basic, in basic doctrinal issues. So first of all there is the war between the Kharijite and the Jabarite on one side and the Mutazila which was very prevalent in the first 150 years after the, the rightly guided caliphs. And um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing out terms again, but you will get used to some of these terms. Like the Kharijite, I've already mentioned to you, they take the extreme view that contravening the law means um, negating or, or, or um, delegitimizing the law. And as such, they regard the, 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 the negator or the person in breach as, at the same time, a, a person who delegitimizes the law. In other words, renounces law, which apply, which then brings to bear the penalty of death on that person. The Jabarite, again, on the other hand, very similarly, also declares man as free of any independent agency. So human beings have no right of choice and all our actions are created and shaped and by God. So we have no independent willpower, we have no independent agency. And so the end result is that the, 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 the criminal is regarded as criminal by choice of God. So in the first hundred and say from the time of the Umayyads, the first uh, dynasty that ruled um, the Islamic world was the Umayyad family, starting with the first Umayyad was Muawiyah, followed by Sun Yazid and so on and so on. And uh, they were staunch Jabarites. So they, they staunchly believed that the, the Caliph is acting in whatever way because of God's will and he's the perfect instrument of God. 
And that is why during the rule of the Umayyads, about 90 years of rule, until about 750, I think, uh, AD, current era, CE, they um, committed many atrocities. There were many massacres. Um, they themselves were morally not um, sort of compliant with many of the laws. They would uh, contravene Islamic Quranic moral laws like drinking in excess um, and doing all sorts of, you know, indulging all sorts of vice. And the argument was always that, uh, you know, it's not me doing these acts, it is God. And so coupled with the Kharijite, actually, that also emerged at the end of the rule of, 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 of the last rightly guided caliph, they then, the Kharijites, regarded the opponent or the person who's in contravention of the law as Kafi. So it laid the basis for much bloodshed and war. And uh, contrast that with the Mutazila, who has the belief that the person in contravention of the law is not, an, it's not, an, it's not a, a Kafi or a negator of law. And also that human beings are responsible for their own actions. So we have agency and God does not interfere in that agency. So that was the one of the main bones of contention in the first 150 years. Lots of wars, lots of bloodshed, etc. Um, then the Ahli Sunnah Aqidah emerged towards the end of the Umayyad period um, as a... As a sort of a compromise between the two extremes or between the two positions. I wouldn't call them extremes. I do, I will, I will sort of declare that I am a Mu'tazila and I'm, um, you know, cannot see any reason, valid reasoning or logic behind any of the other two approaches. So the Ahli Sunnah Aqidah or core doctrine came about as a compromise between the Mutazila, so it is almost as if the Ahli Sunnah wanted to create some sort of peace between the various um, dissenting groups and uh, unfortunately declared a middle way where human beings have agency but not 100% agency, it's shared somehow between God and man and uh, the committer of sins are still Muslim, so they, 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 they basically compromised on that position. So the person in contravention of the law is regarded as 100% Muslim and not regarded in any way as, you know, as deficient except maybe in a moral sense. Um, the rationalist schools, the Ahli Sunnah Aqidah then became the majority Akida under people like uh, Maturidi and Hassan uh, Shaybani and uh, Shaybani Maturidi. So these are the scholars, and there's all history around how they came about because there was a Mu'tazila, <coughs> Wasil bin Atta, and they were in his class, and they couldn't associate themselves with these uh, positions, and they then formed what is called the Ahli Sunnah uh, school. And so the rationalist schools continued under what we today see as Zaidism or Imamism. And there are still Mu'tazilas also that are not connected to Shiism, but to are purely Mu'tazila. But I can honestly say that the majority of yeah, Irtizal or Mu'tazilas exist in these forms in, in the Zaidi school and in the Imami school. So moving on from basic schools of doctrine, basic or core doctrinal schools, um, we then look at law schools uh, or legal schools or what is called Madahib ul fiqh and um, because besides core doctrines the most common um, idea or 
representation of mazhab that Muslims experience is probably in the mazhab of fiqh. And so we want to discuss three topics under this heading. Number one, the origin of these law schools, the founders of these law schools, and the main aspects of these law schools. The origins of these law schools, they originated about 120 years after the Hijra, with the Maliki school initially, and then also the Jafari school, Hanif Hanafite school, and the Shafiite school, and Hanbalite school. Again, I'm not going to bore you with learning Arabic. I just wanted to show you that these schools more or less emerged 100 to 150 to 250 years after the Hijra. And these schools were the product of individual men who sought to make sense of their own community's needs for adjudication on certain matters. So, for example, um, Imam Jaffa would have a staunch following and uh, many of these followers would require him to explain, you know, certain disputes or legal issues or to, to adjudicate. And they, in their own way, became like community resolvers of disputes and they also put down to paper or the their students often recorded their legal positions and these were used within their own community to shape um, you know the legal practice or to just create some sort of harmony within their own followers but then there were others like uh, Abu Hanifa pretty much the same and uh, what I must add is that some of these guys actually attended each other's classes like uh, the the Imam Hanafi Abu Hanifa who was the founder of the school he was actually sitting in the school of Imam Jafar uh, Shafi which is a school also that came 200 years he actually visited the place where Abu Hanifa taught and spoke to his students um, also he was an ardent reader of the works of um, some of the Shia scholars <clears throat> so these actually the only person here that I can't say with certainty that he had a strong following but was rather an academician or legal academic was Shafi coming from Palestine I believe from that part of the world I think from Gaza <laughs> so he actually a famous Gazan um, he in actual fact was more of an academician he was more of a theorist, theorist. and uh, his idea was not to because he came quite late 200 years after Hijra when uh, Jafari and Maliki and the, the other two were already sort of history Maliki, Jafari and Hanafi which is also very early on and uh, he sought to create some sort of framework for all fic, for all jurisprudence to do their work. And so he's the first sort of theory, uh, theorist that, that, that created a theoretical framework. And that is why he's probably the most important of the four. And they all regard him, I think everyone regards Shafi as the most important legal theorist and um, but enough said about that let me we will, con we will, ex I, will I can expand on Shafi's you know principles and his theories in another talk but let's look at the origin of these schools so another Arabic term judge of judges you know, to make sense of the um, 
all the legal disputes and the problems, the head of the state of the time, and there was the king, um, the king, you know, at the end of the Umayyad, the Umayyads had no madhabs, they didn't care about madhabs, they believed strictly in, you know, free will, uh, you know, God's will, is, you know, but when the Abbasid kings came into power, about 750 after uh, a uh, current era, they, after 90 a stint of the Umayyads, the Abbasid kings came into being, and uh, there were these kings, Abdu, uh, sorry, Harun al-Rashid, and Mansur, and the initial Abbasid kings create, tried to create legal, a legal sort of make, mix, make a legal order that spanned the entire um, empire. And uh, they looked around and they found a guy um, called Abu Hanifa, who lived in the area where the headquarters of the empire was. The empire was head, headquartered at Baghdad. And uh, Abu Hanifa is from back, is from near back, he's from Kufa, which is, I think, a few hours drive. So they looked at uh, Abu Hanifa and they, um, they approached him and they said, look, we'd like to make you the judge of all judges. And so that we can centralize your rulings, your legal rulings. And... Uh, <coughs> That offer was made to Abu Hanifa approximately, let's say, 150 years after Hijra, or when the first kings came into power, the first of the new dynasty, the Abbasid dynasty. Uh, they were a dynasty, obviously, that renounced or that denounced the Umayyad Jabberism. They denounced, you know, the, 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 the excesses of the Umayyads and they wanted to create a much better civil order. In fact, they did create a much more civilized order. The Abbasid period is, is, is regarded as the period of the golden age of Islamic progress. So um, they approached Abu Hanifa and said, we'd like to make you the judge to preside over all other judges. And Abu Hanifa declined. And uh, that, I think, is the first time that Mazhab becomes a matter for the state and it becomes a core essential matter you know it at until that time it was it was more or less a community issue people would dispense with legal rulings at the community level but here then it became now a matter of of, of state importance abu hanifa declined and of course um, he died um, as a consequence of that um, refusal. I think he, he wasn't treated too kindly and I think he ended up in prison and he eventually died um, due to objecting that the state would uh, usurp or take over the duty which they, which he felt was left to the clergy and to the scholars and to a different fraternity. And yeah, the state tried to nationalize or, or, or state, uh, 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 capture by the state the legal um, uh, fraternity or the, the, the whole framework of legality, moral, moral legality. So um, Abu Hanifa's students, however, um, Abu Yusuf, um, I'm not sure of the other one, he had two students and they kind of did not maintain this refusal and they eventually became the judge of all judges. So the Abbasid kings or the Abbasid state did succeed in gaining fiqh to be absorbed within the legal, the statutory mechanisms. So these are the founders. They are Malik, Abu Hanifa, Shafi, Hanbal, and Imam Jafar. There were others up to 28 and they continued for hundreds of years new madhabs to be invented and formulated and uh, until finally it was outlawed um, the, the the process of inventing new pathways of fiqh 
was which which is the result of a process that we call you know um, ex uh, academic uh, exhaust ex exhort exhort exhaustion um, or the academic efforts or ta uh, ijtihad that is the term in Arabic was was finally outlawed by a sultan in the 6th century, in about like the 1300s, I think, uh, called uh, Baybar, Sultan Baybars, Baybars. So let's look at the differences in Akida. I want to now, you know, let us get a taste for what are the differences in Akida. Um, First of all, sorry, the differences in Madhab, not Akida. So first of all, we have differences in Akida, difference in core doctrines. We have differences in the primary legal sources, and we have differences in legislation. In all those areas, we have Madhabs. We have Madhabs of Akida, which I've spoken a little bit about. We have Madhabs of the primary legal sources, and we have legislation. I'm going to go through that. First of all, in core doctrines, for example, I'm going to raise two core differences in the core doctrines that have, only, that have a very, very important effect on the law itself. Number one is the justice of God. Now, in some schools, the justice of God is, is upheld, is um, not just upheld, but uphold is upheld in a supreme way. So all laws must be subject to the assumption that God is just. So the innocent cannot be punished, and uh, you know the meritorious should be rewarded, and uh, people should get the benefit of the efforts. So that is an important core doctrine that informs laws. The other important core doctrine that informs the law is the prospect of divine sanctioned leadership. Now, on the one hand, you have people or some of these schools that do not regard that as a prospect. There is no divine sanctioned leadership on earth. And we are simply to operate in sort of practical or um, expedient ways when it comes to leadership. So in those two core doctrines, those have given rise to a lot of differences. Then in terms of primary legal sources, there's also madha, madhaib or pathways. Sunni sources of law regard the Quran as the primary source, but they also add to that Sunnah, but which they regard, which they, in particular, Sunni filtered Hadith. So not all Hadith, but the Hadith that have been filtered by Sunni experts and scholars. Then they use analogy as a method of deriving laws, and then they use ijma or consensus of the Sunni scholars, and not all Sunni scholars. So there's a certain level of consensus that is accepted. So it's not, I don't know if it's called, if you can call that consensus. Then. That's a new meaning of the word consensus. So it's a partial consensus, a selective consensus. Uh, then Shia schools use Quran, Sunnah, but Shia filtered hadiths. Akal, which is different from Qiyas, which is rational reasoning instead of analogy. And Ijma which is also consensus, but also a selective, selective consensus. So it's also partial consensus. Then, uh, just a word on analogy there, which is very important in the Sunni school. Um, Qiyas is to use a particular situation and to apply to another situation and given 
that the situations can have sort of equivalence and uh, so let's say for example if you say the drinker of wine must be flogged and somebody comes and he smokes taha or marijuana then uh, the scholars will argue that you know marijuana is not mentioned in the Quran but by equivalence we can say that it is an intoxicant they can make that equivalent reasoning and then apply the same penalty like lashes whatever 10 20 lashes so i'm just giving an example of analogy whereas aqa or reasoning is purely deductive and inductive logic so it is what we today understand as aristotelian logic uh, a is equal to b B is equal to C, therefore A is equal to C, that kind of logic. So purely deductive logic, but also inductive. So there are many forms of logic, reasoning. I mean, inductive, deductive, retroductive. Today we use, you know, um, um, circumstance deduction by by the, by it, by using evidence. So the Shia schools of law use akal, all various forms of akal, and also ijma, which is a sort of a form of consensus saying. Another important point to mention is that the sunnah and the sunnah there is not the same. I have to mention this. The sunnah of, of sunnis is generally regarded as the hadiths of the prophet. And there's a bit of a contradiction in the sense, and I will speak about this is, I, I cannot go into depth here, it will take another long time to discuss this. But for Sunnis, the Hadith books are pretty much um, authentic and um, guaranteed sort of statements of fact. And they actually are, are, are afforded almost like a hundred percent um, truthfulness in terms of how they speak about the Prophet or how they quote or cite the Prophet. So the Hadiths are regarded sort of at a very very high level. In fact some of them go to the point of saying that Bukhari, the book next to the book of Allah is Bukhari's book. So Bukhari wears like a few thousand Hadiths in is regarded as on a level next to Quran. So they regard Hadiths Sahih Hadiths, which is Sahih Bukhari, the six books, they regard them as uh, very, very high and almost paramount besides the Quran, aside of, from the Quran. The Shia's view on Hadith is very different. The Shia's view on Hadith, they do not regard their books as Sahih, as paramount, as next to the Quran. They have absolutely no view like that. That is why I've often heard Maulana, you know, the departed Maulana Toha Karam in his critique of the Shia, he's often compared or they cite statements from the Shia Hadith books to denounce or to disprove or to expose the fallacy of Shias. <clears throat> but what they don't say is that the Shias don't actually see their own Hadith books as on a par with the Quran anyway. They see the Hadith books as riddled with weak Hadiths, mistakes, wrong, mem bad memory. So they do not regard the Hadith books in any sacred way. There's no sacredness ascribed to the Hadith books. Let me make that very clear. So when a Shia opens his Hadith book, he does not, he's not opening a book that he regards as a book of sacred laws. He regards it in a very practical um sense as a book that has some positive ideas and some nonsense in they they have no problem the the basic idea of the shias was that we will not discard any hadith because if it's nonsense it might make sense in future and so they regard you know their books of hadith as not sahih very very important so you can find a lot of junk there the sunnis however regard all the hadiths as of high sacred value it's very, very important to make that distinction. The non-Shia, then the third I want the third thing I want to mention about the primary source is the non-Shia or the Sunni binary. 
which is an approach to law that does not locate you within that context or within that context. So you, are this, you locate yourself outside of the parameters of both these. Not, not outside of any parameters, as I will show later, there are still parameters, but just not within these polemic confines, because these have been polemicized to a high extent. In other words, they've become um, fraught with, uh, with, with scholarly disputing and with defensive and with apologetics. And so um, the, the non-binary is, is an attempt to sort of step outside of the polemics of the petty rivalry and arguments and to look afresh at the question of, of, of uh, schools of, of law and mother. But I'll come back to that later. So differences in legislation then, we find that there are differences between Sunni hadiths and Shia hadiths. There's different hadiths, but also the view hadiths is different. There's the Sunni Akida or core doctrines and the Shia core doctrines. Sunni believes that God is not necessarily always just. Shia says yes, God must of necessity always be just. So the Sunnis will say, look, there's a possibility that an innocent person could be punished, that you could punish an innocent person. Uh, there is that possibility. So again, rational arguments versus analogical arguments. That's going to be a cause of disputes. Shia consensus and Sunni consensus, that will be a cause of dispute. So there are many re causes or bases on which disputes could take place. And so, for example, one very, very core conflict is the what are the qualities of a leader. The Sunni school says it's only that the person must have passed puberty, they must be of sound mind, and they must confess to be Muslim, even if nominally. The Shia schools are completely at odds with that position. They say no. There is, an, there is merit, the most meritorious person in terms of knowledge, in terms of skill, in terms of ability, uh, in terms of um, wisdom. That person with more merit is more entitled to the office of leadership. Also, the Shia insists on an absence of corruption. So the, a Farsi cannot be a leader. Whereas in the Sunni school, a Farsi is a Muslim. Shia school, rationalist schools say that Farsi is a far or a, or a transgressor is not Muslim while they're committing the transgression. They are at that point a transgressor. So transgressors cannot be leaders. And in Islam, but only with full commitment. So, can you see how this thick issue, the issue of who must be a leader, can give rise to major differences? And if you look at the Muslim world today, in the Arab Sunni world, you will find uh, leaders that comply with these, the Su Saudi kings. They are pu they've passed puberty, they have sound mind, and they are Muslim, even nominally so. Um, but there's no justice, there's no righteousness, there's, uh, there's a state of, um, what is the state, it is, it's a state of oppression and injustice. Um, the innocent are killed, the scholars are murdered, and that is the position there. But they are not contravening any thick matter <laughs> for that, in that, uh, uh, you know. They, they, are, they are technically, they are, they are leaders legitimately. Now, from the Shia school of thought, they would be an illegitimate leader. And from the Shia school of thought, even the Shah was an illegitimate leader. He, he was there because he, he could, uh, you know, get support from America and uh, he had the power of the army behind him and he could separate the population into rich and poor and... Uh, you know, get by with the support of the rich, but they, he had no legitimacy in terms of the thick of the of the Shia. So, let us look then at a non, the non-Sunni Shia binary. So, sacred 
divine law versus everyday practical law. So outside of the Sunni Shia binary, which many modern day scholars are looking at, is that there is sacred divine law and there is everyday practical law. Sacred divine law includes all law enjoined directly in the Holy Quran, only in the Holy Quran. The Hadith is not regarded as a source of divine law. It's a, it, I personally would uh, embrace Hadith as a, as a li, uh, literary source. It is a literary source, it is a source of historical information, it is even a source of wisdom, it could be a source of moral um, you know, wisdoms, but it is not a divine source. I cannot regard it as a divine source. Bukhari is not divine. And uh, even the Nabi is not divine. The, the, the Nabi is, does not, you know, the Quran is divine, the words of the Quran. And so, sacred divine law includes all law enjoined directly in the Holy Quran. Right? So, that is what the non Sunni Shia binary teaches. Or if you're outside of the Sunni Shia um, sort of uh, polemical context, then we regard all sacred divine law as only rooted in the Holy Quran. And sacred law is divided into moral injunctions and legal injunctions. So there are sacred laws in the Quran that are legally binding and there are sacred laws in the Quran that are morally binding. So a sacred law that is legally binding would be a law such as uh, the prohibition on um, consuming pork or the sanctity of life, the, the, the respect for life. That is legally binding. No person is allowed to take another person's life. And the sacredness of property is also legally binding. But there are moral injunctions in the Quran which I'll come to. Practical law on the other hand is all law arrived at by agreement or reflection within the parameters of divine law. So whereas there is the Quran, which is the primary source of divine law, which sets not only some legal injunctions and moral injunctions, it also lays down certain parameters. And practical law, everyday law, is supposed to be derived by agreement or a reflection within that broader framework. So, let's look at the next slide. Examples of sacred laws and parameters. Legal injunctions. The sacredness of life and the security. Freedom of belief. Sacredness of property. The rights of women. The prohibition of pork, carrion and blood. Moral injunctions. On the, so, those are legal injunctions. And they can be sanctioned in the real world. So, they, you can have a sanction for... Anyone who contravenes the, sac the, 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 the sacredness of life, if somebody should take another life, the Quran actually provides a penal code around that, then they, they forfeit their life or, the, or, or blood money. So there has to be consequences, earthly consequences. It's, not a, it's, not a, it's a moral law and it's a divine and it's an a, 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 a actual law an implementable law with a penal code attached to it. So theft is also, in the Quran, the prohibition or the, 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 of theft or the sacredness of property and person. So property, there's also a sanction, and that is that these people need to be, the, the term, the Quran uses the term, they need to be amputated, they, they need to have their hands cut. So is that figuratively they need to be they need to be prevented or removed or is it a a physio, physical uh, meaning which means they they need amputation of the hands uh, that debate we can have um, personally I'm of the belief that the debate is more slanted towards um, a figurative meaning where they need to be prevented so when you say cut their hands it means make it impossible for them to steal. Um, but I'm not, I'm digressing. Uh, so there are lots of legal injunctions, the rights of women, the fact that they need to be supported if there's a divorce case, then the woman is entitled to, you know, period of six months of upkeep, upkeeping or support, 
um, and you are not supposed to make a woman homeless at, on the day of the divorce. So those are all legal injunctions, but there are many, many, many moral injunctions in the Quran, like the duties to orphans, charitableness, abstaining from backbiting and slander. Well, slander is actually a legal injunction, not just a moral injunction. Um, abstain from drunkenness, alcohol, sexual immor uh, morality, immorality. So these are all moral injunctions. So let me take an example. If you look at uh, the, the idea of um, homosexuality or sodomy, I would rather call it sodomy or anal uh, penetration, uh, male on male anal penetration. Uh, and we have to we have to speak on on these subjects also. The Quran uh, uh, um, disapproves of the practice of that particular practice. Modern science also, um, I, I'm, and I'm not looking at romantic science. I'm looking at actual science. The research does show that uh, the harm in the practice, uh, both the social harms and um, physiological harm, and um, as such, um, it is it is disapproved of in a moral sense, but. Is there legal or penal code for it? No. Look, in no way does the Quran apply a penal code for backbiting. And uh, <clears throat> so all we can say is those are moral injunctions. They are moral indiscretions. And um, there's no penalty. So the fact that ISIS is throwing gay people off the rooftops of building, buildings to kill them uh, it's not. It's not founded in the Quran. It is. It is unfounded, and so we have to um, um, place the behavior, the the practice of sodomy, within the category of moral, morally repugnant, and um, not legally. Um, sort of. Uh, there's no legal position on it. It is a moral position. So. Coming to practical laws then, we look at how to sell, how to give charity, how to fast, traffic laws, civil or criminal law, and the ordinary penal code, like penalties and penal, penal codes. So those are the, the, the practical laws. So let me summarize then. Um, the idea of madhab. We started out by saying that madhab is a pathway, it is a school of thought. And then we proceeded to say that that's the, the word madhab is used um, sort of um, metaphorically to apply to schools of thinking, of law. And uh, we then proceeded to look at the basic doctrinal madhahib or pathways. And these doctrinal madhahib um, relate to issues of is God just? Does God decide or does man, where does agency lie with God or with man? So the doctrinal mazhab lie at the basis of the fiqh pathways. And the fiqh pathways are legal jurisprudence pathways. And um, they cover matters that are of, you know, they, they, they are grounded in uh, Quran, in hadiths, in um, in and in other sources, um, and uh, I looked at why is the legal position in such disarray? It's because there's so many different sources, and the sources are at loggerheads, and the Akida, the basic doctrines, are at loggerheads, and then I proceeded to offer a third, a, a an alternative to these polemical positions, which is the non-binary approach where we only look at the Qur'an as a source of divine law and we divide that divine law into, into moral laws and, and actual legal positions. The moral laws do not have a, a earthly punishment but they do have a, 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 a punishment in the year after whereas the legal positions or the legal injunctions have an earthly penal code. Uh, for example, murder, theft, um, and slander will have earthly consequences. The moral injunctions have consequences in the year after, and they have moral consequences. They affect the soul. 
Um, and so um, then the practical laws last day I said was that uh, how to give, how to make sunlight, etc. So um, I just thought, let me, okay, so that I think that summarizes the idea of my thought. And um, thank you for listening.